Good of you to have us for Fourth of July. I think well, this is for our Fourth of July issue. Well, so. please do. Uh, one of the things, I mean, when the readers read this, you'll be front and center, I guess, on a big stage in, in New York celebrating the Fourth of July. Um, people have criticized the event as a as being overly commercialized, but I think you have proved more than anyone successful at um, using a symbolic event or a symbolic time to really help in the leadership of the country. And uh, you know how to use it to get across to America, uh, a good feeling about itself. Would you like to comment about the day and what you hope to attain? Well, I think the pattern was almost set uh, in the 200th anniversary and the, and the parade of the, of the tall ships and all, and, and I thought that the whole country did get a great boost out of that. And I don't see it really so much as being commercialized, uh, this particular thing, since uh, the uh, everything, it, it, well, there are no tax dollars paying for all of this uh, great extravagance. It is being paid for by the people. And, uh, mm -hmm. Have you been to the Statue of Liberty as a private citizen ever? I have never been to it, and my first time to ever see it was an experience I do remember. And, I guess I was a little surprised myself at, at the kind of goosebump feeling. I had, uh, 1948, I had gone to England to make a picture. And I was there over four months and came back on the Queen Mary and had, believe it or not, never seen the Statue of Liberty. And the, it was a very early morning arrival of the Queen Mary and I was surprised at my inner feelings because at four o'clock in the morning, I made sure that I got up and was at the rail. I wanted to see the lady when we came into the harbor. That's good. On, on, a, on a tougher issue, uh, the summit, uh, when we came out of the summit last November, there were reasonably warm feelings, but you're, you have, your actions have been increasingly tougher towards Mr. Gorbachev and the Soviet Union. And uh, I am uh, I'm basically wondering, do you, do you have a new assessment of him since, since that time? No, and as a matter of fact, I have uh, uh, tried to avoid uh, uh, any personal criticism or, uh, of him, although I've been realistic with regard to uh, some of the things that have happened since then. Uh, the failure for us to move forward uh, in real negotiations on arms reductions when both of us have made the statement he has and I accept his word that he wants and would like an eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. Well, this has been my goal from long before I got here and, uh, and I really believe in that very much. But then the proposals are made and we put them in the hands of our negotiators in Geneva and uh, uh, nothing happens to really enter into the kind of negotiations that I experienced once as a negotiator for a number of years in labor relations, that uh, they've made a proposal, you accept some but have some difference on others, you come back with yours, they come back and you finally reach a meeting point. Do you think he bears the U.S., Mr. Gorbachev bears the U.S. or, or you personally any ill will? No, I think that like so many there, he subscribes to some of the beliefs and the propaganda that have been prevalent uh, in their media about us and doesn't understand our system. And he has never seen our country, and this was one of the reasons why I hastened to invite him on the first day we met in Geneva to have the next meeting here, and he accepted. And I think that he, I think he still does want, a, uh, want such a meeting. I also have to believe that Maybe we were a little too optimistic about how quickly he could come in after these last several years of what they've been through and establish 
uh, a new administration. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, spies, Mr. Reagan. In, in this year of 1968, 86, we're prosecuting more than any time in the history of the Republic. And, uh, and they've taken our, our lives, our secrets, our technology worth billions of dollars. Do you think your administration should stop trust, uh, treating these people as white-collar criminals and start treating them as traitors as we did during the era of the Rosenbergs? Well, if we're talking about those who have been arrested as spies here, I think that is it. They are being prosecuted as spies with uh, tremendously heavy penalties if they're found guilty. Oh, Mr. Reagan, I've visited some of those prisons and they're, you know, they're not bad. I'm talking about during the time of the Rosenberg administration, we treated them as traitors. We, we had death penalties. Uh, how do you feel about this? Our secrets are there. Well, I'm... I'm not a lawyer, and uh, uh, so I don't know where the uh, where the proviso comes for asking for the death penalty. But obviously, they are traitors, and uh, maybe it's a difference between spying and wartime, in which you have caused the death of of people. Uh, as I say, not being a lawyer, I don't know how that uh, comes about as to what the penalties are, but. Uh, I know that there are very severe penalties that are being uh, talked about. If well, would you favor uh, would you favor uh, uh, something like a death penalty? For uh, well, I happen to be supportive of the death penalty, but I also, as I say, I'm not uh, I'm not aware that our laws provided for such things as this peacetime spying. I'm quite sure that in wartime. Uh, Yes, the lending of comfort and aid to the enemy and the spying for the enemy, then we know that that penalty applies. But we allow them to, we allow them to cop pleas now. And, and they do sit in, I mean, in my own magazine, we had uh, Walker explaining how it was like a country club where he was in prison. And it seems like very, very uh, lenient uh, kind of punishment. And, I, and that's what I wonder about. Shouldn't these people, well, haven't what they've done, haven't, hasn't what they've done, it's, they're traitors, and shouldn't they be treated as traitors? And, and the U.S. government, you know, lawyers go into the courts and, and make this yeah. known. Yes, but isn't this true that for a great many years past, we have had a kind of liberal philosophy in this country which did tend to coddle all kinds of criminals, and uh, maybe this is part of it, and the constant assailing of uh, prison conditions as being inhumane in our country, and therefore uh, they must be improved. Uh, isn't this a... But can't you make the difference if you say to, the, to, your, to your government lawyers, you know, I don't want these people to go to a country club prison. Can you make a change so that people understand that giving away these huge amounts of technology you know, it's to make 25000 so they can have an extra boat. It's not a good thing. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I don't know exactly what the, uh, the situation is as to where they would be. I'm quite sure that the federal prisons, uh, uh, the bulk of whose uh, inmates are, uh, are not people of this kind who have done something of this kind. Uh, but isn't it true that there has been a philosophy, uh, a kind of soft on crime philosophy up and down in our country for a number of years now. But now you've been in office six years and I think you've changed people's attitudes about this. And I wonder if you uh, weren't able to change the system a little too. Well, isn't, isn't confinement uh, really the, the punishment itself? Uh, should we uh, follow the gulag? and say that we're not only going to imprison them, keep them confined, we're going to add uh, discomfort and torture, denial of human rights uh, uh, on a larger scale than that. But I think there's a big difference between Alan Wood and, and the Gulag. But let's not. Oh, well, let's. Your, your domestic policies are in getting, getting increasingly more conservative. And you, you spoke recently of, of third term. You only, do you ever feel now with only two years left that you, you have a short time to remake 
America as you wanted, and if you did have six years instead of four years, what would, what would you expect to achieve that you don't have time to do now? I would be very much opposed to the idea of a six-year single term. Uh, no, I'm saying that if you were to run, you, you yourself, you have endorsed a third term, even though you would not no. run for a third term. That's right. But if you had six years right now, which you don't, you only have two no. years, what would, you, what would you want to achieve, which you can't well, in this time? Well, I'm going to try to achieve what, what we want in these two years remaining. And I have to tell you, I had the same experience as a governor. And many of our greatest gains, including probably the most comprehensive reform of welfare ever attempted in this country, we got in my second term. Uh, I have never thought for one minute that I am going to uh, suddenly sit back and say, now I'm a lame duck and I can't get anything done. On the international scene, there is still, and we're working as hard as we can on the Middle East situation for what I had advocated quite earlier, and that is to hopefully bring about negotiations to end the state of warfare that technically exists there between Israel and the Arab states. Of uh, the matter of arms, I still believe that we should be on the road to the elimination of nuclear weapons. And back of this is SDI, our Strategic Defense Initiative, which I think could be a great help in bringing this about. And our efforts to pursue, through succeeding summit meetings, the beginning of arms reduction with the Soviet Union. And I think there's reason to hope there, because the Soviet Union has some economic problems that have been aggravated by their tremendous military buildup. So I'm not I'm not thinking that they will suddenly change their spots or something, but I'm thinking they may find it to their practical advantage to join in arms reduction. On the economics and the government side, the whole idea of federalism has been greatly advanced. We have a program uh, in operation here in our administration aimed at a change in management procedures in government, and great progress has been made there. I can remember as a governor looking at some social programs of the federal government and actually finding out that it cost two dollars to deliver one dollar of help to a needy person. And this is the type of thing we're trying to change. We have vastly reduced the number of publications that the federal government puts out as well as made some healthy cuts in the number of personnel employed by government. All of these things right now, the tax reform well, is there, idea. Is there one thing that you really hope to do coming in in 1981 that you feel you will not be able to achieve uh, by the time your term is up? Well, there are a couple of things there um, that have been headed off on. One, and I'm not giving up on them though, one is a, a constitutional amendment that would ban in the future uh, deficit spending. Uh, two is to give the president some prerogatives that most governors in the country have and that is the right of line item veto. The federal government is one of the last remaining places where the legislature can sneak into a bill something that they know could not pass on its own, a spending measure, an extravagance. But it's a pet of theirs, whoever the individuals are promoting it, they want it. So they sneak it into a bill that is so essential that a president will have to sign that bill and thus they get it. Now. 943 times in California, in eight years, I vetoed such line item things and found that never once could the legislature, if that particular bill then had to be put up to be voted on by itself, they could never get the two-thirds majority to override my veto. And yet it took, in my state, two-thirds vote to pass the budget in the first place but the same two-thirds would not vote for it if they had to stand up and do it <laughs> publicly. Mr. President, if there was a constitutional amendment in effect right now that prevented deficit spending, and your administration certainly has had the largest deficit spending that we've known in the history of the country, how would you be running the government? Well, for one thing... What would you cut? Well. I can only tell you that just look back at the record of the cuts that I have not been able to obtain. 
All of this talk about this deficit being mine, the president can't spend a nickel. The Congress spends the money. Right now, and since our budgets, and our first budget was the 1982 budget, we inherited the 81 budget, right now there would have been $207 billion less in federal spending if I had been given the things I started asking for in, in 1981, in cuts in various social spending, elimination of some programs that I don't think are the proper province of the federal government to begin with. I don't think the federal government should be running railroads and doing things of that kind in competition with the, the private sector. But many social reforms that not only did, should, some should be eliminated, but others that shouldn't be eliminated should be more properly aimed at the people of true need. Instead of setting a figure and then uh, a minimum figure, let's say, and saying, well, everybody uh, at this level and below is entitled to these various government programs. Do you, do you expect that you would have spent as much on the military and would have cut some on some? There has been about, as I recall it now, about a $64 billion cut so far in what we had asked for in military. And that is the one place, the only place, where the, where the Congress has reduced anything in our budget that I have submitted, but they've increased over you know, all in the domestic side. And yet to this day, our defense budget is only about 30% or less, running somewhere around 29, 28% of the total federal budget. Now, back in an earlier day, you'll find that national defense was about 50% of the federal spending because that is the one thing that is the, the prime responsibility of the federal government, is the national security. But there's been, and not just with me, this goes back uh, to FDR, when he had his own Democratic Congress, and yet they would deny him the things that he was asking for when the rest of the world was going up in flames before World War II, before we got into it, would deny him this. There's been a tendency on the part of Congress to think that a source for more money for pet projects can be found in taking it away from national defense. Let me ask you on uh, uh, the situation with the contracts where you have a lot of Americans not saying we should not aid the countries. The majority of Americans say this. Do you think that sometimes Americans, citizens, don't know what's best for themselves and the country? And do you think that we as citizens are too faint of heart sometimes? I still think that the people of this country, in their wisdom, are the ones who are in charge. Government is by the people here. But I do think this also. Thomas Jefferson said, if the people have all the facts, the people will not make a mistake. But on a thing like Nicaragua, I have to say the people do not have all the facts. There has been a tremendously successful disinformation campaign. And yes, it has been helped along in many instances by the media that has portrayed the Sandinista government as something different than it is. And this goes also for the freedom fighters, that they have been portrayed in a different light. We've been doing our utmost to try and get the truth to the people, and I think more and more people now do understand uh, what we're, we're trying to do. But if you run up against that, and then you run up against a thing that it is so easy for people to think, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't even know where Nicaragua is, and we've got our problems at home here. What are we doing down there? Well, wasn't this the same type of thing that got us uh, Cuba? You'll remember there were people telling us and uh, voices in the, in the media that said that uh, George Washington, or that uh, Castro, Fidel Castro, was the George Washington of Cuba. And uh, as soon as he won his revolution and was installed, he then said, I've always been a communist and we're going to be a communist country. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we have benefited in one way by that, that a million or so refugees fled Cuba to our country and they have become very fine and successful citizens. Uh, to, let me ask you a lighter question. I, I think it should be considered lighter, Mr. President. 
Um, your son is about to go on the masthead of Playboy, is my understanding. And I wonder, in the light of the findings of the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography, is this a source of some embarrassment or amusement or whatever? No, I have read the first article that he did for, uh, for that magazine. Uh, one of them, I think, was on the convention back in 84, and the other one was on, uh, on um, the Geneva summit. And I tell you, I have to say I was, I was surprised and greatly gratified to find he has a, his own writing style and I think does very well. And I don't think he'll be indulging in, he won't be writing pornographic material. Have you, have you ever, you've obviously looked at a skin magazine since you've read his articles, have you ever looked, uh, watched a blue movie and have you found them repugnant or? Well, I've never uh, sought out or tried to run one of those uh, uh, movies that appear in those certain kinds of theaters or anything. No, as a matter of fact, I have to tell you that, and I'm not a prude or a blue nose, but I have to tell you that uh, I've not been very proud of some of the legitimate things that Hollywood is is turning out these days. I thought back when we all observed the voluntary code, it wasn't censorship from outside. The motion picture industry set up its own code of what would not be on the screen. And this had to do with language, and it had to do with uh, uh, explicit sex and so forth. And uh, I think the pictures were better. For one thing, uh, I just object on the grounds of some of the rules of theater that are being violated. There's an oldest rule of theater is that you can't do anything on the stage or now on the screen that is as good as the audience's imagination. And today we don't leave anything to the audience's imagination. Do you remember those wonderful scenes and so forth in which you could take the children, they could be at the movie with you and then there would be that scene of the embrace and suddenly the camera pans over to an open window with the curtain blowing and the moon shining outside and you fade out on that. Well, the audience takes care of that with their imagination. And there's no embarrassment uh, uh, with their children. And, uh, and you don't have any embarrassment now if young Ron is, is in a brown envelope. I mean, you know, they're putting brown wrappers on Playboy. <laughs> well, I could perhaps wish that he would find a some more dignified sources because I think he's capable of it. He's, uh, his writing is very good. good. That, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Both your trusted aides and, and your own children have benefited by their, financially by their closeness to you. I wondered if sometimes you feel like a, a commodity, Mr. President, and... No, not really. Uh, you know, there's no way they can escape that. On the other hand, there are lots of disadvantages to being the kids of a president. Well, I wasn't just talking about the kids of the president. I was talking about many, uh, many White House aides that walk out the door and just oh, by the perception oh. of their closeness to oh. you uh, well, I'm do sorry. very well. I mean, yeah. do you think the rules should be changed? That you are, that's what I meant, yeah. as a commodity. No, let me, let me point something out there about the type of people that you get in government. Most of the people that have come into our administration, well, I said it over and over again during the campaign. I didn't want people that wanted a job in government. Uh, I wanted the kind of people so successful that they would have to make a sacrifice to serve. And I'm surrounded by a great many that are in exactly that position. Now, I also know that in many of them, younger people, children growing up that are gonna to have to be educated and all, there's a limit to how long they can stay at the government uh, level of income when they know they can do better in the outside. Indeed, many of them gave up much better incomes in the outside to come here. And there comes a time, and many times I've sat in that chair when someone comes in and tells me they have to leave and they tell me why. That they've now got a family problems, of income and so forth, and they have to, and I've said to them then, look, when you give me that as a reason, there's no way I can try to persuade you to stay. I can't argue with that. And to, to get down to rules and to start saying they can't uh, go out and better themselves, you know, it's difficult enough already to get this kind of person to come in government. 
things that have been passed that are born out of past scandals or something uh, in which an individual has to bear his entire personal holdings and so forth, uh, has to uh, uh, report every year on uh, uh, what he got for Christmas, even from friends that where they've been exchanging gifts for years. And the same thing holds true for a president, you know. I wonder, how, how do you go to somebody and say, how much did that, pay, that sweater cost you? I have to put it in the paper. Is that what you had to do with the Buckleys on the dog? What? The what? With the Mr. and Mrs. Buckley when they gave you Rex? Uh, yes, we, everything, anything that's a gift has got to be, uh, we, have to, we have to report it. But I, th I think this, that in order to get that kind of person, uh, don't make it more difficult than it is. And I, I would think that maybe there could be a review sometimes of some of the things that, that are almost insulting that we impose on people okay. before they can come to government. But don't you think, um, for instance, that Mr. Deaver, for instance, that the Canadian government really probably thought they could get uh, a good hearing, a better hearing, because he had worked for you? And is that, um, is that a good thing? I mean, I don't uh, mean to sort of yeah. peg him. Is it a good thing when somebody knows that they have influence with you, or at least a hearing with you? You know, I think that's much less of why they hire than it is the knowledge that this individual knows his way around Washington mm -hmm. and knows the situation, knows the things that are impossible in our government to do, knows the things that are possible, can advise them of, as to this could not, this thing you're asking uh, just cannot be done uh, under the laws and so forth of, of the government. Uh, I think there's much more of that than any idea that somehow an individual can come in here and lean on a president, any president, and say, hey, do this for me. I just don't, I can't think of a president that would do those things. And certainly no one of the people that have left this administration have ever, ever tried to, to do anything of that kind with me. Mr. President, on a stranger level, uh, in the Washington Times on Friday, uh, I read a story that a psychic from the Midwest, from Chicago, had written a letter to you predicting the destruction of the space shuttle and even went into talking about the O-rings. And NASA, the letter has been forwarded to NASA and they're taking it very seriously. I was wondering, do you think psychics ever make sound predictions and have you ever used the services of a psychic? No, but I have to tell you this. <laughs> it's my UFO I, question. I find, it, no one, I find it difficult. I didn't know about this particular case you're talking Fascinating. about. Fascinating. No, they're good. But, um, I find it difficult to write them off entirely. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that there will be such people. Uh, the Bible has even referred to that. But the reason I'm saying this is I know of instances where police in our country, for example, with the Boston Strangler, and I know of one uh, that I have met personally, uh, and a little more than that, in California that has been used, and I know of an instance in which there were bodies missing in an airplane crash down near Palm Springs. And this individual told the police that the reason they couldn't find the wreckage, they hadn't been able to find it, is he described a canyon and an overhang, and that it was under there, that it had gone under that overhang. And from his description, he'd never been there, the all uh, uh, and when too many law uh, enforcement agencies around the country have, have resorted to this. Um, I wanted to ask you, the latest Gallup poll, which I think was this last weekend, said, showed that you had never been more popular. Uh, you, to what degree do you think your ability to get straight to the American people on television and put out simply what you have in mind, what you want to achieve, uh, get across those ideas? To what degree is your popularity in that? And can a person, could a, a person be elected president nowadays who cannot perform, I mean in a show business sense, on television to reach the American people? Well, there's only one rule of show business that is employed in all of this. And anyone can do it. They don't have to be a performer. But the one rule is every actor knows but when your face is up there on that screen in a close-up, if you don't believe the line you're speaking, 
the audience will know it and won't believe it either. But and uh, if some somebody goes, some people are better than others. I well, mean, <laughs> and I just wonder, you feel? I mean, you believe in? I think the American public believes in you uh, well, when you get in, up in there. I believe in them. Well, now tell me, what do you taking another television personality? If I can, if I can, what are, what is your? Uh, do you have any comment on the political future of Pat Robertson, of the, the evangelist? I I don't know, but I'm. Have you ever watched him on television? Uh, I have seen him now since there's been talked about, and a few times that he's on the news, that he's been on the TV news and all, and uh, certainly he's uh, much respected by uh, his uh, his following and those people who uh, turn to him for their religious counsel. But there's one thing that I must point out. All this suddenly being raised, and is this right or wrong for him or for religious people and all? How come there was no... He's not the first clergyman to run for president. We had one in 1984 that sought mm -hmm. the Democratic nomination. And I have to wonder, is the criticism now a little bit because this one is seeking the Republican nomination and not the Democratic nomination? But no, no one should be barred from running for public office or holding public office on the basis of their previous occupation or profession. Oh, I didn't mean it that. I meant how do you see him as a figure? And I w didn't mean, I didn't imply a criticism of this religious backing, but how do you see him as a figure in the political um, arena of the Republican Party? Well, I'm, I'm quite sure that he is totally sincere in what he is uh, what he has proposed doing, and uh, but would he, he give be, George Bush a, you know? I don't. Know. All I know is I can't comment on. Remember, I'm the titular head of the party as long as I'm in this job, and I therefore have to remain neutral in the inner party uh, uh, contests for primaries. Then, when the party has made the decision, the people in the party as to who should be the candidate, I'll support them all out. But I don't, I'm very hesitant to say anything that uh, might be interpreted as uh, for or against. But even anyone. behind the scenes, you might not. Yeah. <laughs> not even push behind. One. The, not even behind the scenes. No, you can't do that. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, well. Uh, basically, we should ask. Uh, We've gotten more letters about Lucky. We're wondering. Uh, <laughs> we're wondering how she is, and we've heard reports that Rex may be joining her because of the polling we're talking. Uh, no, let me just say here, and this will thank you. You're going to give me a chance to clear something up. <laughs> Lucky was not exiled. Lucky was always intended to go to the ranch, and she's there. She is the queen of the place. There are five dogs, and she is. She's really taken over. She's a giant now, but that was what, she was an outdoor dog, and there was a kind of cruelty. We had to keep her for a while until she reached a certain age and all, and was still undergoing training uh, here. But, you know, to have to take her out on the leash as they did out on the lawn there and walk her around, that was not for her. And when we go to the ranch, you find out she's in dog heaven out there. 688 acres of meadowland, forest, everything that you want and running free. And uh, that's where she was always intended to go. Now, Rex is an entirely different dog. Rex, I think, is probably happier uh, in the house than out. And so it was. there's no hardship in having him here and then out on the lawn. And when we go to Camp David, oh, he has a great time running around there outdoors. But uh, Rex, I think, would be totally lost at the ranch. Is he going to have to stay in Beverly Hills when you move back home? <laughs> I think he would continue to be our home dog, but uh, really, I mean, from a standpoint of risk uh, up there, uh, that's wild country. What could and get? Uh, Rex with bobca oh, bobcats, mountain lion. Oh, that's a terrible thing to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. 1988 better well, not come quickly yes. for him. We've even, for times, uh, every once in a while, we have a, a bear that moves in. Yeah. And uh, I've never seen the bear yet. Others, other people up there are. So that's, that's dog heaven for the other kind of dogs that we have are all outdoor dogs, a husky and, and uh, a golden retriever, things of that kind. 
Mr. President, Larry is throwing us out, and, and uh, I just wanted to ask you one question. To accompany this, we would like to run your favorite picture of you and Mrs. Reagan. Do you have one favorite picture that was taken at any time? You know, I have to. No, I have to say, with regard to this, that uh, having been in the motion picture business for all of those years, both of us in Hollywood, and then governor, and then here, we've had a jillion pictures <laughs> taken of us. I wouldn't know how to find out or have a favorite. There are just you know, so darn many. There's a pretty good one over there. I, I kind of one that uh, you like. But um, but the that's why that's really from, why we asked because oh, there's so many pictures taken. Yeah. We thought perhaps maybe there's there was one, one in an instant. But no, yeah. I I like. Uh, We've got a few that I can choose. Oh. How about that? Oh dear, <laughs> I've got them if on horseback. I've got them uh, uh, <laughs> well, dancing. I've got them with everything that you could imagine. Uh, You've got them dancing, uh, band, kissing. You know, uh, well, yes. maybe one. Uh, I, it'd be hard for me to pick one up. I think they're all pretty pictures on account of her. I don't add to them, but she does. <laughs> Mr. President, while you were, while, while the interview was going on, Pete went out and checked on uh, that uh, espionage, penalty espionage. It depends on which statute the case is filed under, the action is brought under, so your answer was basically right. The Pollard case was brought under a statute that allows only life sentence uh, as the maximum. And uh, of course, it's still being discussed in the courts as to what the sentence will be. And we can't comment on that. But that's the that's the fact. One favorite picture of mine up there in my dressing room is, is uh, of Nancy. I'm not in it. Nancy's about that high, just a little girl. <laughs> and I have that. She was cute. When she girl. was in New Jersey, back in the uh, yeah. Well, maybe we'll get a copy of that. <laughs> you can write the caption underneath it for us, what you think is the suitable. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I don't know whether we, I gave you any startling material or anything or not. Have a good Fourth of July. All right. I hope it's not too hot for you and too miserable out there floating around. Well, we'll be out there in the carriers.